Harkis CG back for another episode. We've only just went and got Steve Darby. Welcome back to Harkis CG TV. Today I am delighted to have someone on the show, someone that I wanted to interview for quite some time. So I'm delighted that he's managed to arrange some time to have a chat with us. We have Steve Darby on the show. If you aren't aware of Steve Darby, Steve Darby is, I hope you don't mind me saying this, almost legendary status here in Southeast Asia. Such an interesting person and so much, so much stuff out there and I'm literally delighted to have him on the show as I know there will be a lot of interest in people wanting to hear what he has to say. So, Steve Darby, thanks very much for coming on Come the show. On. Xin chào. Come on, Come on, Xin chào. Okay, oh. so... Good to teach in Vietnam. I tried to learn Vietnamese, I struggled a little bit uh, as I got up. I'm much better in Bahasa Malaysia. A lot simpler to actually learn it. And there's no tones in Bahasa. Uh, yeah. Whereas, you know, that can kill you in Vietnam. You can say the wrong word and you, know, you can have a completely different word if you use the wrong tone. Yeah, um, for example, if you don't want to start getting butter mixed up, there's many different ba, 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 ba. And a lot of the ba's are the ones that you do not particularly want to get mixed up. Anyone that speaks That's Vietnamese, correct, yeah. yeah, and I have made that mistake. Also, when you're asking for a big tiger or a can of tiger, there is another way that that could go. That's that, that probably <laughs> something you would say after the watershed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so Steve, let, let's kind of let, let's get into it here. So so you grew up from a very solid working class background in Liverpool. Can you tell the people about your years growing up as a kid and when you realised that you had a insatiable love for football? Well, I was lucky enough, and I'll say lucky to be born on Anfield Road, literally. And I went to Anfield Road Primary School. So every day I'd walk past Anfield, I always touched the wall. Stupid thing, but I still remember doing it. Yeah. And one day the ground was open, I ran in, leant over the wall, stole a few pieces of grass, would you believe? I kept them for years. That's how daft it was. Well, my dad took me to Everton one week, Liverpool the next. He wanted me to be a blue, but fortunately, I'll say Shankly was around and the man was magical, absolutely magical. And his influence, even from the age of about probably seven or eight for me, has kept right the way through. He's still my hero uh, and he started me becoming a Liverpool fan. And, and as you say, you can change your religion, you can change your wife, but you, you can't change your football team. Absolutely, I couldn't say it better myself. So, you played uh, when you were younger for Tranmere Rovers. Was there any other clubs in, in England that you played with, or clubs that you wished that you'd got to play for? Well, what I was, I was a five foot nine, 14 year old. So I was a big goalkeeper at 14. Only thing was I never grew after that. <laughs> uh, but basically my career was halted by a severe lack of ability. Uh, <laughs> so I, I did the rounds, I went, went to clubs like Wrexham, Burnley, you know, places like that, because yeah. you sort of, when you're in a certain level of schoolboy football, you get invited to places. I was going to go to Everton, and the night before, I didn't play football, I played cricket, and I tore my cartilage keeping wicket. Uh, but I, I wouldn't have made it, though, let's, let's be honest. Went to Tranmere, uh, signed like the associate schoolboy form, they called it then. And then the coach come to me one day and said, we hear you, you're good enough to do A-levels at school. Yeah. I said, yeah, but I had no intention of doing football. I wanted to be a footballer, you know, yeah. uh, like nothing else in the world mattered. Absolutely. He said, no, do your A-levels. And he was right. In hindsight, not good enough to make it. And of my youth team in that era, I don't think any of them made it. None made it big time anyway. So so you would say that you were a, an accomplished coach because you were a failed footballer, like so many great coaches before and after? Well. I, I always remember thinking about there's, there's more to football than this, you know. But like when I was at Tramia, <coughs> we did a lot of running, yeah. which pre season. And I kept thinking, it's not doing me any good. There was no goalkeeper coach in those days. 
Yeah. And then I remember play, I played for Merseyside Grammar Schools. A fellow called Steve Koppel played in the same team as me. Yeah. And we played against Cologne schoolboys from Germany. And I always remember watching them and thinking, they're different. Because when I got the ball, I whacked it down the far end of the pitch, as I always did, as yeah. everyone did. These their goalkeeper rolled it out. I'd never seen that before. Yeah. And they passed it around the pitch. And I always kept thinking, <clears throat> there must be something more. Sure. And when I went to PE college, which to me, PE teacher was the second best thing to being a footballer in my mentality. Yeah. Uh, I met a coach called Merv Beck, who was a lecturer there, and he taught me what coaching was, and he opened my eyes to the game completely. Yeah. I did my FA uh, prelim mm -hmm. with Howard Wilkinson and Jack Charlton, people like this, wow. and the whole game changed. I suddenly realised that, yeah, yes, you can. There are, there are people who are naturally brilliant, Nothing you can do about that. I've, I've realised there's things you can't teach, like being in the right place at the right time. You know, you just can't teach that, the strikers. Uh, but there are a lot of other things you can teach and, and coach the same principle, really. Yeah. So that was really my step into coaching through phys ed teaching. Yeah. That taught me to organise. Because if you can't organise, you can't coach. Because sure. if there's chaos going on around you, you can't get over your message. Yeah, yeah. I think that you have you have different kinds of coaches where you have coaches that want to coach tactics in the game, whereas you have other coaches that are more um, man management based and then they appeal better to the players and in many ways it can be the balance that you get you get between them. Which one would you say? Would you say you're more of a tactics based coach or more of a, ma a man management coach? If you're coaching professionally, there's only one thing you do, that's win. Because if you don't, you're not going to be there anyway. Yeah. So that's the bottom line. Youth development difference. There you're working on people, individuals. You can be patient. When you're working for your living, your mortgage, your rent money, your food money, in some cases, it's different. You've got to win and you've got to do everything that matters towards winning. I would say I was more of a player's coach because I just think players will win or lose your game anyway. Yeah. You know, no matter what. But I've seen successful coaches who have been what I call the media coach or the president's coach who'll say, yeah, I think your team's great. They put them in, they're going to get sacked anyway. Let's be brutal about it. In football, you either get sacked or you resign. So I'd, I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Uh, because the amount of interference, as you know, in Southeast Asia is yeah. massive. Yeah. There's been a couple of jobs I was offered in Vietnam. Where I asked questions. And they basically said, no, you, you, you don't pick the team. I do, the president. And I said, well, there's no point, mate. It ain't going to last. You're only going to sack me. And if you sack me, you're not going to pay me out. Yeah. In Vietnam, know that. Uh, they, they pay you up to usually the day you worked, if you're lucky. Yeah. You know, but I said, no, no, if you give me a contract, I'll work to the contract. I'll work to it. You must stick to it. So it never worked. Okay. Never, never worked in terms of a club in Vietnam because of that interference. Yeah. So I mean, also with that, there's a there's a huge culture shock. Did you consider a move to the USA and Australia a culture shock uh, compared to that of coaching in Asia? Well, I literally went where the contract was. That's what it was. I I just all my life I just wanted to be a full time footballer. Not yeah. good enough to be a full time player at a great level. Uh, I played in Australia, USA, things like this, but not the big boys, you know, up like in England you know, or Scotland, I might say. But um, so I got a phone call while I was teaching in my first year of teaching. Yeah. Do you want to go full time, full time coach in Bahrain? Didn't even know where Bahrain was, but said yes. Yeah. And all I heard was full time coach. Didn't ask about the salary. It turned out to be about six times six the salary. Times your, I was going to say, I heard it was six times your, your, uh, your salary. Yeah, uh, but I didn't ask, even ask, but I just swam there to go full time. But, and that was the start of the journey. But I also learned that the most important thing is if you're a foreigner, you've got to win. Mm -hmm. Because you're more expensive than the local. That's the real world. Uh, so you've got to be value for money, bring value into the club. And that is in Asia. I'll talk about Asia mainly, obviously. Value for money is winning, nothing else. Yeah. Development mm -hmm. is winning next week. Long-term development is winning by more next week. Sure, sure, sure. Excellent and, and a good way to look at it. So so you won the, the Malaysian League, uh, but and, and I'm sure that you probably still watch the Malaysian League just now and you've watched it evolve and you've watched it grow. 
What do you think is the main change that you've seen from when you coached at JDT to how the Malaysian Super League is now? Uh, when I was there, TMJ, who was the, the current owner, Tenku yeah. Makuta Johor, he, he was a little boy. Yeah. He used to come across the training field in his, you know, on his, on his horse or his little tiny cars they had. Yeah. But I had the ball, nets and the bibs in the back of the boot of my car. The lads got changed in their cars. We had a ho one hose pipe. You know, and now they have, he has put his money where his mouth is Absolutely. and he's developed out of this world training facilities, employed good pros from all over the world. Uh, you know, the, the, the head of the director of football is Scottish, Scottish Australian Alistair Edwards, right, but yeah. he's got Spanish, Mexicans, he's got all sorts in there. Yeah. So he has done well. But the main thing is he's actually said it and done it. A lot of the time in Malaysia, they say it, but don't do it. The yeah. potential in that country is tremendous, but there's, there's certain areas where, you know, we can probably talk about that later. I'm sure that they, <laughs> that needs going on. But the difference is now is I think the pitches are better, yeah. and that makes a huge difference in the game of football. If you, you if you can't train well, that's the one thing. But then you go to the game and you're playing on grass about nine inches long. You can't train because it's always going to be wet. It, you know, yeah. you've got to have a decent pitch. They're starting some decent pitches now. Yeah, and you've got that lettuce grass as well, which is just difficult and it's not the best for passing the ball and stuff like that as well. And yeah, but uh, but a lot of the pitches are, are I think improving. it's called cow grass, and they see <laughs> grass is the real stuff, yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of the Vietnamese pitches, yeah, you can't play, they've got no grass on at all. Yeah. And when I was here, we trained on various pitches, which, you literally, I, in one place I went to train, there was a buffalo in the middle. And the buffalo was just standing there in the middle. And I said to me players, hey, get rid of that buffalo. And the player looked at me, captain looked at me, and it was a, it was a girl, she said, coach, you go and get rid of that buffalo if you want to. She said, I said, why? She said, one person gets rid of the buffalo, that's the buffalo man. And he'd gone to have his lunch and come. So I had to wait till the buffalo man came back to move his buffalo, because that buffalo wasn't going to move. <laughs> and they're big when you get they're big aren't they yeah yeah they are they are big as well and if there's one there's always an, there's always going to be another few of them around as well and the, for a size they're they're good at sneaking up on you even though for the size that they are as well so it's interesting because you've kind of fed that right into my next question because i was going to say you left Johor for the vietnamese national women's team so obviously the first question there is What's the biggest challenge there? Is it the movement from men's football to women's football or a language and cultural difference, particularly when it comes to coaching football in Vietnam? Well, I mean, before I coached the Australian women's national team uh, for the, the World Cup in 91 and, and 95. Uh, so I never found it a difference between coaching males and females. They were footballers to me. Didn't yeah. care, treated them as the same in terms of all the way I put sessions on, made no <laughs> difference. You know, You've got not cases who are female, not cases who are male. You yeah. know, you've got good pros as males, good pros as females. So that was never an issue. Language was the biggest issue in Vietnam yeah. um, because when I came in 2001, there was virtually nobody spoke English. Yeah. The, a block of people spoke Russian, a block of people older spoke French, and some of the young ones were just starting to speak English. Because yeah. and the biggest difference then was MTV made a difference. Because yeah. 2001, the internet had only just started, and it wasn't really big in in, in Hanoi, you know. Yeah. So you had to have a translator, and I had about four translators at first. I, I had one who just kept saying yes, 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 and I said to her one day, I said, "Are you a giraffe?" She went yes. So she was. One. Yeah. Uh, another one who took notes. I said, "What are you doing?" She said. I'm taking notes, I'll translate tonight, I'll come back tomorrow. I said, no, I want it now on the pitch. Yeah. She went and I walked into the VFF one day and I saw this absolute creature about six foot in high heels and a mini skirt. So she had a good start anyway. And she said, good day, mate. And I looked at her, I said, how do you learn to speak like that? She had taught herself Australian in Australia. Yeah. So she could speak colloquially and she was brilliant. Not only brilliant translator, but politically, she taught me when to shut up, who to be smile to, who to shake hands to, who to just ignore, and oh, it was, it was a, a huge cultural education. But 
you get things like one day, and she was very, very good. I said, knock the balls, get them to knock the balls to the far post. Next minute, the balls are going bing, bing, and they're hitting the corner flag. I said, what are you doing? And she said, you said hit it to the fur, the stick. And now the far post, you know. And then, <laughs> then I learned the next one, never use it. I said to her one day, I said, tell them to, I'll use the word flipping, tell them to flipping well it. And there was silence. I turned around and she's looking in her little dictionary and she never used that usually, she was too quick. I said, what are you doing? She said, I know what flipping is. In fact, I quite enjoy it. But what is this welly? There's no word called welly in the dictionary. And of course, you need to learn your correct words. And I've learned that later, you've got to start to use either local words, like in Thailand, yeah. and ying for press and shoot. Uh, but you can't, you know, you've got to use slang. because. If a lad's about 18 and 19, he's under physical pressure of playing, he's under mental pressure of being a young lad. If he speaks in his language, you've got a chance. If you start speaking in English and he can't go to your translator to translate his own head, you're slow. You've got to learn language if you can. I mean, it really makes a big difference. Yeah, I actually, I found it really quite interesting that if, I, when I was able to direct a taxi driver, then you can direct a footballer and vice versa. So if you're saying D D D D D D cham, while I watch I will fly. So you can say left, right, go forward, turn around, come back. All the things you say to a taxi driver, you can say to a footballer. So as so once you master one, you can master two. But I 100% agree. You've also you have to learn the language as much as possible as well. But, and you've also said, so Vietnam not, was the most difficult. Yeah, I mean, it was very difficult. Uh, Thai was the worst because I can't read it. Because yeah. you had to literally remember what they said. Whereas Bahasa Malaysia was the easiest. Uh, and the, the players taught me all the good words. Vietnamese female players were great. They were as tough as you can get, really good pros. I mean, and they, I once said to me, uh, to my translator, you know, oh, tell them I'll send them back the rice fields, laughing. And she looked at me and said, Coach, that is the truth. Don't laugh about that. Yeah. And, and, and they, they took me to a rice field one day, the players, and I will never ever go in a rice field again. It was the most backbreaking experience in my life. Yeah. And I could feel things going around my feet, which I have no idea what it was, but rice fields is not a good option. Yeah. But I mean, they were tough. We, want, we couldn't play other females because we obviously win because we're the national team. So. What, how we prepared was we played the men's under 23s who were based at the same place. Uh, so we play them once a week. Now, how we did it was they would play one touch and we'd play three. And in the end, it got to really competitive games because the power element was taken out of it. Good for the lads, they had to worm touch, which is not easy to play. Uh, and it was good for our girl players because they could get stuck in and tackle and they, they, they could run past players who were going to knock them over. So it was getting the power aspect for them. So they were great things. But occasionally we played, I'll say, over 35s, where it was just a free game. That was fine because the, the, the physical wasn't as good. And we played a British embassy team once. And there's this, I'll say, rah-rah, the public school boy. Yeah. And he's, he's whacked one of our players. And I said to him, mate, don't do that. And he said, oh no, they've got to learn if they're going to play with the big boys, they must learn how to do this. I said, that's not the reason, mate. He said, oh no. So he went and he kicked another one. Five minutes later, blood pouring from his ankle. McCarran, who was a great girl called Luong, she just sailed in over the top, did him, nothing for it. And he's come off screaming like a little kid. I said, mate, that's what I was telling you about. You don't touch, they'll get you back because they were tough people, but lovely people. And the moment they won the SEA Games gold, you should have seen them singing the national anthem. They yeah. meant it. No, in the national anthem there, they mean it. In terms of football, not the greatest, but in terms of, for me, but in terms of emotional achievement, for them, oh, it was out of this world. You know, they really loved it. You know, yeah. they were great people. And, and you, won, you won the first ever gold for Vietnam with uh, with the women's team right yeah it was a big thing because a gold medal in football at that time 
in the men's football, it wasn't realistic. They had a very good Singapore team. You had Thailand, they were you know, out of top class you know, then, and they probably still should be. Uh, so there was never going to win a men's. <clears throat> but we knew the women. We had to beat Myanmar, which we did on penalties. Uh, then we got to the final to play Thailand, which we won quite easily. So it, it was, you know, a feasible thing, but it, it, it took two, they were full time for two years. Yeah. You know, I had a technical director, for want of a better phrase, who was abusing me in the newspaper for playing the wrong dicks. We'd never been beaten in two years. So yeah. I don't know what the tactics were wrong about it. But, uh, and even up to the last minute, the day of the cup final, the Sea Games Cup final, my goalkeeper come running down the tunnel crying. And she didn't cry, she was tough. Yeah. She said, what's wrong? He's just told me that I'm not playing. Then the reserve goalkeeper come running down crying. I'm not playing. He's just told me I'm... And she knew she didn't. She shouldn't have been playing. Number one was top class, you know. Yeah. So I went in and I, I basically I broke the cultural rule. I got him against the wall. My translator was on the other side, going to kill him as well. The reason was apparently he felt I had too many Saigon girls in the team. Oh. Uh, not enough Hanoi girls. Because oh, okay. and, and you think about it, he fought. He'd been in the war, so he still had that, you know, problem with North and South. Whereas to me, they were all Vietnamese. Yeah. I didn't care where they came from. Yeah. You know, it didn't really matter. I I couldn't tell the difference between a Saigon and Hanoi accent. You know, but it was a. Uh, I mean, culturally, that one of the funniest things was, oh, we, we every day we were doing a session on the pitch, and the first thing I did anyway was I reduced the training, because it had a Chinese coach before, and all he'd done was run, run. If you got injured, you ran it off. Yeah. Didn't allow them to get treatment. Thing, nutcase. So. I spoke to my captain when I got in, and she was you know, a very bright girl. And she's still involved in football, which is great. And she said, Coach, the, the, the girls are all injured all the time. So I got that sorted out, and we re reduced the training, trained in the shade in the morning, things like this. There was a bloke in a tree every session. And I said to my translator, who's he? He says, oh, that's a spy. What do you mean? Because that was your translation, the Jean Diep, I think the word is. Uh, so she said, oh, yeah, he's just taking down the Ministry of Sport. What are you doing? So they can justify the salary they're paying you because it was a Ministry of Sport position. Sure. And I said, came over. And the poor lad came over. He was shaking like a leaf. I said, show me your notes. And his notes were absolutely superb. Far better than anything of my notes. Because I used to go home and write them at night. Is but better. I said, give me a copy, mate. I, I love them, please. I got him a chair, put him under a tree, sit here, mate, be calm, have a glass of water, go for it. And I mean, that was the culture. I mean, and they, they told me that in those days, there was like a, there was one day my translator came to me and said, coach, they haven't paid me. Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? It turns out she refused because she'd been brought up in Australia as well to give a kick, a percentage kickback to the, the accountant at the place. So I went straight up to the accountants. I pulled out Bonga, the big paper at the time, because newspapers, as you know, then were huge. Yeah. Hundreds of newspapers. Yeah, the big broadsheets, yeah. Yeah. This is the biggest paper. I pulled out the front page and said, next week, your picture's on this. The front page, English coach goes home because his translator wasn't paid. And literally, she pulled the door open, pulled a big brick of dong out, yeah. Give it to the translator, never a problem. Yeah. But I learned, you, know, you said there's cultural things which you never get taught on a coaching course. You couldn't, because you couldn't predict that on a coaching. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. And there's also the there's also the mentality in Europe uh, a lot of the time that it's all out there and it's all the same. And trying to explain that the difference between Korea and Japan and Thailand and Cambodia and Vietnam and Singapore and Malaysia and Laos and Indonesia. Each one of them is massively different from each other, massively different. There's many similarities, but there's as many differences as there are similarities. And I often say to people in Europe, when, when, you, when you're in Italy, you're going to eat pizza, but you're not going to go to Dublin and get great pizza. Whereas the, the, the general impression in Asia is it's all the same. And they are as massively different, if not more different than Europe. In, in Asia. 
But I do have to ask you this question without it making my my inner Scott and you as a scout, you can understand as well. Is your gold medal under a good locking and key? Is it well well hidden, well looked after? Uh, most of the medal, well, like all the medals I've won are in a shoebox. Uh, you don't need to I, I keep them there. <laughs> the, the money's in the bank because that was. Important. <laughs> yeah. I the medal. I gave to my translator because I knew it meant something to her. Wow. Because she they didn't have a medal for her. But she, without her, I wouldn't have won. I wouldn't have won it. So I gave her the medal. But um, the only thing I have on the walls, I collect shirts as well, obviously. That's yeah. the uh, football thing. But on the wall of my house, I've got photos of teams and players, of lads who have worked with. The people are the most important thing. Like, even back far as 78 in Bahrain, I'm still in contact with a couple of my players there. Uh, and all every team I've coached, not every player obviously, but every yeah. team I've coached, I'm in contact with some of them. Uh, obviously through the internet now, it's far better. But it, it's, it's been really a good thing for people pay of me. I, there's places all over the world I can go and stay. You know, some don't want to stay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, it's, you know, it, that's the good thing about football. You, you get mates for life. Yeah, like a football, uh, like a football Airbnb. As long as you know someone in football, you can crash on their couch. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it's funny you said that actually because um, I we will be interviewing uh, Adil Sharin soon because uh, he's at Kedah now, and I believe you coached him when you were at Home United. Yeah, he was a smiling assassin. Uh, I, I mean, you can pick some people who are going to be coaches. Uh, and his brother, Adi Iskander, yeah. had the word coach stamped across his head. But he's out, the, out of the coaching game now. I would never have picked a deal as a coach. He was never said two words. He kicked people and he was a good player and he read the game well. He used to, he used to play sweeper for me. I had two markers and a deal behind sweeping and the, his brother was one of the markers. Uh, but he has done well. He's done his homework. He's done his apprenticeship. And I'm delighted for him. It's great to see ex-players doing well, and he and he really is a nice guy as well, which helps. Yeah. You know, I actually thought he'd be too nice, but he's obviously done it, and I've utmost respect for him. Yeah, excellent. I'll I'll pass on the regards when when I speak to him later on, hopefully later on today. Yeah. So so also so then you moved us to a youth coach in Sheffield. What was the what was the reason for that? My view is I go where the contract is because. Yeah. It's good. Some, some days you're lucky, you get three three jobs offered. Other times it can be six months and nothing comes in. Uh, so this was the next one in. It was the only one in at the time after Vietnam. I knew we'd stayed in Vietnam as I got sacked yeah. because the next step was the Asian Games. Sure. And we'd have to have played Japan, Korea, China. We'd have got beat because it would have meant I was not a good coach then. Yeah. I'd have got sacked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the logic. Logic. So I thought, yeah. get out when we've won. So I got out, went to Wednesday, enjoyed it, but I was working, say, 70, 80 hours a week, freezing cold, absolutely you know, thick, thick snow at times in Sheffield. Yeah. And then about a year, Terry Yorath was the coach, the, the, the first team coach, great bloke, lovely fella. And Willie Donachy was the, was the first team coach, top class coach. I used to watch those two work every day. So it was a good education as well, you know, watching play people like that. And then I got a phone from Singapore and this time they told me the salary and it was four times what I was on at Wednesday as a yeah. youth coach. Because youth coaches don't get paid that much, as you know. Yeah. So I spoke to Taff, Terry Yorth, and he'd been to Lebanon as national coach. He said, mate, you're not, the chances of you're going to be a first team coach here are pretty slim. And that was realistic. That's, you know, that was genuine you in advice because I hadn't played at a high level yeah. you know most of them have to have played you know, it's changing a bit now but yeah. then it was a case of no chance so I said okay I went there and the bank manager patted me on the back and said well done because that was a great decision Singapore <laughs> you know because when I first signed the first contract it was a 13 month contract a year and he said you'll get two months for winning the league a month for if you win the cup and you'll get double if you win the double and we did the double. So it was about 19 months for a year ago. So I was, and I was also working for ESPN Asia on TV. Uh, so my, in a sense, it set me up. 
financially. So if you get reasonably comfortable, I'm never going to be a multimillionaire uh, unless I go, unless I got fixing, which I won't do. But basically, that was a good financial mood to, to leave Wednesday to Singapore, and it, you go from working 18 hours a week to working 16 hours a week in the sun and 18 hours a week in the snow. Yeah, big difference. Yeah, yeah, it's not a difficult decision, is it? It's not difficult to decide. So, so you went on to, to so you were at Home United <laughs> there. Have you kept in contact with, or rather, have you kept watching how Home United have developed now into Lion City? Because obviously, similar to, to JDT, they're an entirely different setup now. They're building a, an academy in Singapore. There's millions being put into the club. Do you keep up to date with things at Lion City Sailors? They changed the manager. Because you know, in Asia, the manager is an incredible role. It yeah. can mean someone who supports you, like in Johor and at Parak, uh, who was the C CEO off the pitch, I was CEO on the pitch. Yeah. I had that in Singapore for three years. Then they changed it. And I got a bloke who came in who thought he was Alex Ferguson. <laughs> and I just said to them, I said, look, mate, it's not going to work. I always remember I had a, a, a salary cap. That's what's us going on to big things in, in Asia. We, we got the semi-final of the, the AFC Cup and our salary cap was 70,000 Singapore dollars a month for the whole squad. So what we've done was we've got 16 best platforms and I had four zero on buttons, nothing, it was run. So I only played the 16 lads and then we had a lot of injuries and gave a couple of young lads a run on the wing. They got the appearance money, which was just their salary. Uh, but the, I got a phone call from Dwight York's agent and he's rang me and said, oh, Dwight York wants to come and play for you, which that was the first lie, because Dwight York's never heard of me. I knew that, but you get used to that with agents, as you know. Yeah. And he says to me, um, can you afford him? I said, well, I've got 70,000 a month. Salaries make a huge difference. If we had a no salary cap, we would have kicked on a bit further. You know, we were never going to take on Japanese teams and Korean teams, but yeah. we might have got a bit further into the Champions League, as JGT is starting to do now, and yeah. Buriram in Thailand are yeah. starting to do. Buriram, the bloke there, he's put his money's mouth is. Facilities in Buriram are done Incredible. as well. Yeah, so yeah. it can be done, but the real it's money, it's finance. You get the best players, pay the best wages, and you get the best facilities. Best results, yeah, exactly. So you reportedly knocked back a job in India as as a head coach round about that time. Is is, is that right? And if so, why? It, it must be true if it's in the paper, <laughs> <laughs> or, or in the Indian papers in particular. Yes, I have definitely. no idea where that came from. I was reading it myself that I'd been offered the Indian job. But I learnt when I was in India. I've been four times to India that the uh, the press can be flexible in their truth. Sure. Shall we say? Yeah. I mean, and uh, particularly the Bengal press, by the way, a lot of the journals there, they get paid by the story. And yeah. you don't put us in, you paid. You were successful again in Malaysia, which then led to you working with Peter Reid, which obviously we need to talk about. And with you wearing your, uh, your Thailand top here, which isn't going unnoticed, you then worked with Brian Robson in, in Thailand as well. I mean, that must have been a, a really special time. And I'm sure you must have plenty stories from a fly on the wall perspective, but can you tell us maybe one or two stories that stand out the most from you from that time in Thailand? Yeah, I was I was with Parak. We were playing in the AFC Cup away in Lebanon. And yeah. it was my last game with Parak because the reality was there that the government had changed and the new government in Parak stopped paying the players and stopped paying me. Uh, so I knew I was going. So I was walking along the Corniche in Lebanon, beautiful in Beirut. I get a phone call. All right, dear Dabs, how are you going? Do you fancy coming to Thailand, lads? I said, come on, who's this? I thought, yeah, someone's, one of my mates taking the mickey out of me. Yeah. And it turned out to be Reedy. He said, do you want to come to Thailand? Be my coach, he's going to be the manager, which was a godsend. That him, the manager, it was like the British role, and it was great. Both him and then when he left, which sadly he left, uh, Robo took over again. Another all I can say is two great football men, genuine blokes who would be happy. You sit down in a pub with them or a coffee shop, 
and they would talk about football for hours. They yeah. love the game still, because I mean, two plants uh, who'd work their way th up through ability and hard work and were genuine people. Uh, I mean, you obviously had the one one time who, when I, I'll read it first, obviously, we had to have a translator. And the first time it was ended up really speaking Scouse to me, I'd translate into English <laughs> to the translator. But we had one day, we had a translator who was a really nice lad, been educated at rugby school in England. Posh as they come, lovely fella, very far better English speaker than I was. Yeah. And he said to Reedy's going, I want you to do this and you used to do that and you used to do this. And he, he whispered to me in my ear, this, this translator, who is this used chap? We don't have a Hughes on our team. It's not a Thai name. <laughs> so I had to explain to him that. And then on the first trip away, the first away trip with the Thailand team, the I'd come a little bit earlier, so I knew some of the Thai lads. I'd signed them in Singapore. I had a couple of great lads, Suri Suksomkit, Surachai, Anorak. I'd yeah. signed those three in Singapore. Good pro, great players. Anyway, we're on the bus and I put in, I used to put videos in, foot videos in, and I put in England against Argentina, 86. And next minute, the captain sidles up to him, whispers, coach, is that him? Is that him? I said, yeah, it's him. So he's turned around, he's shouted to all the lads, and 25 lads charged to the front were going, Maladonna, you kick Maladonna. Why you no kick him? Why you no catch him? You tell us to run hard. You no run hard. Yeah. And of course, he loved it. He played up to them brilliantly. And yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and what really taught me was that how to manage upwards. He had the he had the prime minister of Thailand in his back pocket at the time. Yeah, he met them. To, he he could mix with the top, the elite, and he made them feel comfortable. Wonderful knack at doing that. Yo, uh, then when he left, Robbo came in. I mean, the funniest one with Robbo was I was walking down Bangkok Street with him, and we saw a lad in front, Man United shirt on his back. Number seven on his back and Lobson, L O B S O N. And we didn't have the heart to tell him it's not Lobson, you know, it wasn't Brian Lobson. <laughs> you know, but the poor lad thought, so you know, we I, couldn't break his heart. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. I once put Rob in, I put Robbo in a practice match and because we were short of players, first team against the reserves in the national team. Man of the match in his 50s. You know, and my, my star midfield player, a fellow called Co, that's a con, come up to me and said, Coach, how does he do it? So what we did in the next half was I told Co to come on the reserves and just shadow him, go with him everywhere. And Co come off, he said, Coach, I'm not even, obviously a translator, I'm not even sweating, but the ball keeps coming to him and there's no one ever near him. Yeah. I said, and he sees things which I can't see. I yeah. said, well, I can't teach you that. Yeah. I said, I'd love to say, yes, if you do this, I will teach you. I said, but it usually comes out from playing hundreds of games. Sure. And that's what I, I mean, I had that with the with strikers. You get lads who just were in the right place, the right time. I don't, you can teach technique, how to finish, how to head a ball, how to hit a ball. Yeah. But being there in the right time, I don't know if you can or not. I had a boy called Tierson, uh, Louis, he called him, Night, only 19. He gave it, I gave him his national team debut. Great player, hated training, couldn't stand it, yeah. but loved playing. And when he played, he was top class. So, so speaking of people that you've worked with who are legends in the game or became legends in the game, and obviously the word legend is thrown around a little bit too easy these days in my own personal opinion. But when you were in Thailand, you also worked with Zico. Zico, another one who's gone on to make quite a considerable name for himself in coaching in Thailand. And now he's the head coach, as you know, for Wuhan Yulai in Vietnam. And they were top of the league before the, the league was, was finished. So do you, do, you stay, do you still stay in contact with Zico? And did you, did you see him as a coach for the future? Well, first thing is he deserves the word legend, Thai legend, because he is. Firstly, as a player, in 1998, my first ever game in Malaysia against Pillis, and I saw this little stick insect on the wing, and I said to my manager, oh, can we sign him? Because, again, colonial mentality, I thought all Asians were the same. He said, no, he's Thai. I said, what do you mean? He said, his name's Zico. I said, what? He 
it's yeah, they all have nicknames in Thailand. Is it Zico? And I realised why. What a player! Then I met up with him again when he was coach of Chomri. And the first thing is he can coach. Yeah. You know, absolutely technical coach, top class. But he's also got the total utter respect of the players. Sure. Uh, and he was my assistant at the Sea Games in Laos. So I've shared a room with him for two weeks, and it was fascinating. First thing he did in the morning, I'd hear grunts and moans. I'd wake up, look up, there he is doing a thousand sit-ups or 200 press-ups, fit as he come, the lad, and he'd finished by then. Yeah. Then he would pray, about Buddhist. He would, you know, he had a picture of the Buddhist above him, and he'd pray on the bed. No shame, as I shouldn't be ashamed, you know, but no, didn't care. You know, it was his business. Very, very good coach. And it was, a th I think, an absolute crime that he got sacked as Thailand coach because the players wanted him. Yeah. The players didn't want a foreigner, they wanted him. And he understood the culture, he understood the players. And I think the problem was he was getting bigger than the president yeah. of, of the FA. So that was fatal in, in Asia. You yeah. don't get bigger than the president. I think the something... Teams win because... Yeah, I was going to say, I think something that stands, uh, that, that, that really just reflects how well he's respected in Southeast Asia. You know the rivalry between Thailand and Vietnam. And for Zico to be the manager of Wahonyulai and the Vietnamese absolutely adore him. They love him, uh, particularly the Wahonyulai fans. So for Vietnamese to adore someone who's from Thailand for you know, the, the natural competition between the two nations to be the, the kings of ASEAN, it's a, it's a massive compliment just to, to how well he's respected. It's, gen, it's genuine because he, he played in Vietnam as a young lad because the Thai league was quite poor and they used to export players. So yeah. I got three, uh, you know, three in Singapore. He also picked a boy called Tawan played and Zika came to Singapore and then they went to Vietnam and made good money and that's delighted for them. But he's also a good bloke. He's a you know a dedicated family man. He's got three daughters who he absolutely worships, mm -hmm. you know, on his social media profile. But he's also honest, and I mean that without tongue in cheek, because you sometimes don't get too many who are honest. And he is a genuine honest lad. He doesn't bow to the administration. He doesn't bow to the media. He's his own man, and that takes a lot of strength to be your own man sometimes in your own country. Yeah, yeah. Because as they say in Asia, don't break your rice bowl. Yeah. I, I understand that lads you've got to live there. As a foreigner, I can leave. I will be leaving one day, always. But the lad who lives there has got to live there forever. And his kids might go to a school, or you might want to go to a, a, a bit better hospital. And if you upset the wrong people, that can matter to affect your life. So it, it takes a great deal of inner character to be a strong man in your own country. Yeah, yeah. And he's massively respected in Leicester City as well. I've, I've heard lots of reports from uh, Leicester City and people visiting Leicester City when, uh, you know, when he when he comes in, things get done. So it's, it's really refreshing. It's really nice to hear someone, particularly someone who is such a big name, such a big figure in Southeast Asian football, getting such global respect as well, which I think doesn't happen enough to some of the or many of the talented players and coaches we have here in Southeast Asia. So, so fast forward in a little bit to when you went to, to Mumbai City. Again, so that was the first year, that was the inaugural year of the Indian Super League. And without name dropping again, which of course means that's exactly what I'm going to do, you came in and you coached Nikola Nelka, Freddy Lundberg, Manuel Federic, um, players like that. I mean, that must have been incredible for the first year for the Indian Super League as well. Well, it, it came in a strange way. I got a phone call. Do you want to coach Mumbai in the ISL? And I'd heard about the ISL and I said, yeah, sure. And he said, but you've got to bring a big name with you. So I suggested Engelbert Humperdinck. That was a long name. <laughs> that, that, that went straight to the keeper, that one did. Yeah. So I said, I'll get a reedy. Oh, oh yeah, get Peter Reed, <clears throat> England International. Because I owed him one for getting me to Thailand. Absolutely. So I said, look, what you'll be on. That's what I'll be on. He said, yeah, no problem. Anyway, we get there and we were after the players had been chosen. Because in those days, the ISL, a draft system, and an auction, and 
to be honest, the agent absolutely raped some of the clubs. Some of the players who shouldn't have been there. Yeah. Uh, some were on his ridiculous wages, ridiculous what their ability was. But like, that's a whole story about the tier of the agents, tier yeah. of the players. But you had good players like Robert Perez, for example, some very good South Americans from lesser nations, not Brazilians, lesser smaller nations who were top players. But we've got Anelka coming. And I, I, I went, oh no. In my exception of the media, of course, he'd just been suspended for making a sign on his arm, which they said was political. And really said, really rang up some other mates. He said, don't worry, he's okay. And that was absolutely was okay. So I learned that you never have this perception taken from the media. He was humble, um, shy. Whenever the arrogant guy people said he was supposed to be dedicated pro, if you said be there at nine o'clock, he was there at 10 to nine. That's good. You said wear a pink sock and a green sock, do it. Uh, he said behind, you know, for training sessions, <clears throat> he said to me once, can you have some shooting? So I put a couple of sessions on, it almost destroyed me goal as hard. He never missed yeah. he kept hitting the target. <clears throat> and this was on a full pitch. You know, it was awful. He didn't care. But the main thing was a genuine lad who played for the team. He cared about the teammates, the Indian. He was involved. He, he, you know, have a lot of respect for him. Friedrich, it was strange really, because I looked at, I'd never heard of him. That sounds awful. But he played in the Bundesliga. I thought he's got to be a good player. So I googled him. The first picture that came up is him marking Ronaldo. You know, uh, and I thought, oh my God, he can play this lad. <laughs> he's marking. He, he played for Dortmund yeah. against um, Madrid in the Champions League. So he wasn't bad. And I watched him and I thought, well, I wonder what's the special. And I realised later, nobody ever got past him. He kept nicking in front of the ball, standing, nicking the ball off people in front. He never got his shorts dirty, and he always passed to someone in the same dirt, which is quite a skill at times, you know. <coughs> and a, another good pro, a model pro, really good example to the Indian lads. Now he embraced the culture. He he would go off on bus journeys. He's brought his wife with him. He'd go off on bus journey. I don't mean car journeys. Bus and train journeys in India yeah. are scary and he would do that yeah. and he'd go out amongst the people into the slums he really engrossed engulfed the whole concept of being a foreigner fascinating lad and he's still doing things now his wife runs a foundation in india so he was an unusual character that way but a good player as well yeah that sounds great so so also kind of moving on after that um i, w I was quite interested also when when I was kind of trying to look into a lot of the, the other background that you had, you became the technical director and then the national team coach at, at Lao. What was the particular reason for being technical director and then coach and not coach and technical director? If you get what I mean, it was, kind of seems all back to front. Yeah, uh, salary. <laughs> because FIFA, FIFA pay you a salary for a TD. Mm -hmm. yeah. a technical director yeah uh and of course that my mate was the national coach a fellow called dave booth great coach big lad and he he, he ran me up and said, look do you want to come here as td he says because what happened was the world cup qualifiers had been put on the same time as the sea games so the overlap he said i can't do both and he said what i don't want is to give up one of the job to a, someone who i don't trust someone who won't stop me Someone who, or actually someone that look after the players. So I said, yeah, I said, you choose. You know, I'll come in as TD because I've I'd done a lot of that anyway in, in Thailand and Australia. So I knew what I was doing. So I, I did that role. And also, he said, look, I'm going to take C games. That's what I feel I've got a chance of doing something good at. He said, you've got the national team. You're going to get battered, which was true. <laughs> you know, so I said, great, because I wanted to be, I'll be honest, I wanted to be a national coach. Yeah. I have no qualms about saying that. Uh, I've coached in the World Cup now, I can say. Yeah. I've coached with Thailand in the Asian Games, in the Southeast Asian Games, the Asian Cup, but this was the World Cup. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, I yeah. want to do that. Sure. Wasn't the biggest salary in the world, nowhere near Thailand or Mumbai, but I didn't really care. Yeah. Great people, the, the administration, 
backed everything I did to the hilt. Uh, really try their best. They, you know, the president of Vipet, great job he did. You know, he would get maximise the FIFA funds, and then he would spend them. We got a pitch, we got a gym. Now without a pitch, we couldn't have trained because these lads were all semi-pro. Yeah. You know, really amateur to an extent. Yeah. But they were plowing money into facilities. To be fair, a bit like Vietnam has done now. They've plowed into meeting, you know, and they've made it a good place. We, Vietnam needs a lot more grassroots facilities. Absolutely. But at least starting at the top. How you get pe I mean, you know, five o'clock every night, they're out in the street, the lads and the girls, yes. playing with bricks down as posts, as you know. Absolutely. You put a three or four bit down, they play, and they play till it gets dark because there's no more lights. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's what I try to explain to people. It's like stepping back in time, yeah. but the good part of it, you yeah. know, it's uh, and it almost the next step. If, if you're not playing a football in Vietnam or in Thailand, it used to be it could be poverty, and so that's, poverty is the one. You know, and so I've got a lot of respect. I mean, some of the Vietnamese players I saw there was a fellow called Son, played for Kong, and I came up in 2000. I said, look, mate. I can get you to a club in Singapore. How much are you on now? And he said, I'm on 200 US a month. I said, look, I'll get you thousand dollars at Singapore. He said, thank you very much, but I can't go. Because I'm a colonel in the army. I said, you've never been in the army in your life. He said, no, I don't. He says, but I'm there for life. You know, I've got a, a salary for life off the army. I said, okay. And then he smiled and said, Ventus offered me a bit more. I said, which Juventus? He looks Juventus, Italy. And they'd offered him the 3,000. But he'd go there either. They wouldn't let them out of the country in those days. But the first one that really went was Cong Vinh. You know, it takes a lot of courage for the Vietnamese to get out because language. Yeah. You know, if Cong Vinh speaks a little bit of English is all right. And again, cultural, they miss the food. Yeah. That drives me crackers when I hear payers miss the food. They miss their family. Yeah. They're not the same as us. They have a different concept of family. It matters that, yo. Know, uh, when I was in Malaysia, I had my star striker ring me up. Can't come training today, coach. I said, why are you injured, sick? No, my mum got to take her shopping. Yeah. I said, wow. I pay your wages. You play in Malaysia. You're up front for Malaysia. I said, coach, you can find me. You drop me. But I've got to go because my mum said. Yeah. <laughs> and I learned. It's it's you gotta it's go. you gotta, it's you gotta it, take culture. It is understandable that you would miss uh, the food though, because I, I've got to say it's probably because of COVID. It's a few years ago now. I went to Holland and I found myself in a Vietnamese restaurant in Holland ordering pho because I was missing the Vietnamese food so much. <coughs> <coughs> but but yeah, I, I miss the Malay food. I'll be honest, uh, but Vietnamese food. Not yeah. the best. <laughs> yeah. And certainly, as much as I love Indian food, I did discover in Calcutta, you don't go local. Because I discovered what Delhi Belly means. <laughs> and I spent the night with a pillow and a blanket in the bedroom because it is the most horrific experience of my life. Don't go local. Do what the, the guides say. Don't eat street food. <laughs> but in, in Lao, we played Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And we went to, we stayed in a five star hotel, FA, Lao FA, did everything right. The lads, a lot of them, they weren't eating the food. It was five star food. Next minute, they said, Coach, can we go out? I said, Of course you can. I don't believe in looking madness. I said, he said, Oh, great. So three or four of them went out. They came back about half an hour later with a package of cockroaches, fried cockroaches. Do you want one, Coach? Oh, you know, so I said, Well, that you can play better tomorrow. You play makes you play better. Eat a hundred, but I it won't make me coach better. Know that. Well, I mean, you can. Them. Why, why do you say players must eat spaghetti when there's rice there? Yeah. You've got to find the culturally correct reason. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So at hundred percent. So with that in mind, what would you say are the three biggest challenges uh, for Asian football? in particular and they can be any three because there's more than well, <laughs> well first one is match fixing corruption you've got to get rid of that i don't think you can get rid of it you can reduce it but you can't get rid of it and 
I mean, the V League is hilarious. Some of the things you see on on YouTube. Uh, that the first thing is corruption. Second thing is you've got to have better training just and playing pitches is yeah. the most you know a good game of football is usually on a great pitch under lights at night. And you look at some of the games in JDT now, top class. Yeah. And you look at some of the games that start at three o'clock in Saigon in forty degrees. Looks like a pitch it's concrete. Yeah. You're not gonna get this. Third thing, administration. There's great players, there are some great coaches, I say I mean as the end, but they've got to stop interference by administration. Now, it, I'd say it does seem to be getting less, but there's still examples of, of you know, what we see going on. Uh, uh, you know, you've got to live, you've got to die on your feet and not live on your knees. Because if you get the president picking a team, you're going to get sacked anyway. Now, I mean, I had one president ring me at three in the morning. I mean, I tried to be culturally, because I let speak to him, you know, and he gave me the team for next week. And I said, I guarantee we will lose 3-0. He said, how do you know, 3-0? I said, because that's the punishment you get for fielding 12 players. I said, you've just picked a team playing 4-4-3. He went, oh, to be fair to him, he laughed. He said, okay, I'm sorry. I said, okay, let me get some sleep now. You know, and that was when he, he realised he'd been a bit daft. Because I said to him, who are you going to drop? I said, picking plays is easy. Dropping plays is not that, that, that easy. You've got to you know, do things as a coach. So, but they do interfere. It's how you reject the interference is often a skill. How you manage up, which you really used to, Robbo, uh, you know, that's important as well. You know, you've got to do things like that. But uh, you can accept, you know, I mean, it's going to go on. Some clubs have been very lucky. I've had great managers. Other clubs I haven't been so lucky. You know, but that's part of the game of travelling. And where I've last three years, which is quite long for a foreigner, I've had a good a good management system. Yeah. Where I failed, and I'll use that word failed, you know, reason places like Mohan Bagan and Kalantan, I had clashes with the management. Yeah. Uh, and to an extent match fixing in one of those clubs. Yeah. So I heard um, I heard a story about <laughs> the AFC uh representative coming to speak to your guys when he was uh when you were at lao and it always reminds me of a very kind of brief story when i was at the vff up in hanoi at the training facility and i went into the vietnamese home dressing room um you know the, the big training facility with uh, down near the the national stadium and in the dressing room they have a big poster on the wall about the evils of match fixing and who to contact but of course, the exact same as your story in Lao, because the entire poster's in English. And so none of the Vietnamese are going to understand that. So I saw <coughs> you had something similar with an AFC representative when you were at Lao with the with the anti-corruption flyers. Yeah, that came along. Beautiful blazer, well-dressed, nice tie as well. You know, 40 degrees. For the la after, lads, I said, look, can we do it after training? I said, because the lads will then be able to, you know, go have a sit. So we sat them down on the track in the shade so that they weren't going to get baked. <clears throat> and he spoke very well. And everything he said was 100% correct. Then he gave each a lovely shiny brochure. And then he, he went, goodbye. You know, fair enough. And when, I, when the lads got up, there was a couple of aeroplanes flying around with these brochures because they made great aeroplanes because they were all in English. Yeah. None of these Lao lads spoke English. And of course, there's a hotline. Well, the thing is, these lads don't trust anybody. Yeah. So firstly, firstly, it's a strange number. It goes, so they mightn't have the number access on their phone. And I'm not going to speak to a stranger because there are so many people up the food chain could be the end of their career. So they just shut up, Yeah. you know? I've got no time for those that fix it for greed. No time. I understand poverty. I've seen players broke. I've paid players wages myself in Malaysia. Even in Singapore, that's why I understand fear. I got a death threat. A lad rang me, you've got to play this player, you've got to get a result again, you've got to score three goals. And in the end, I make death threats. So I told the police, who were home United way, the police, and they found out that you can't trace a phone fax. It was in those days a phone fax. So what they did was one of the students came in, great bloke, big 
right up in the Chinese community. When the phone rang again, because I knew, I knew what time he'd ring, he took the phone call, spoke in Hokkien, the Chinese dialect uh, of the Singaporeans. He mentioned a few words, which I understood, and a few names, which I knew. Never got another phone call. So all he'd done was he'd mention names higher than the fixer in the food chain. And you don't argue with these blokes at the top. Never happened again. So it's not a black and white issue of win or lose, cheat or not. There's many, many shades of grey yeah. in terms of why they fix. And there's many ways to fix. Sure. It's not just win or lose. You can win a game and still fix a lot in the game. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's not not an easy issue. It's a complex issue. Yeah. And and I, I mean, I, I've personally been contacted to arrange matches and put on matches for particular. I was recently offered uh, Jamaica to come out, but the, I was then told that they would be youth players from Jamaica, so we probably wouldn't recognise the players. So straight away, I was thinking, well, this isn't going to be the Jamaican team anyway, and this is this is going to be one of those behind closed doors type matches where they can fix the the result. So unfortunately, yeah, preaching to the converted there on, on that too. It, I mean, it goes on. Wilson Raj Wilson Raj wrote yeah. a wonderful book called Kellon Kings. Yeah. Uh, and that is the story of match fixing. And when I read it, I read, yeah, this is true, because I've been involved in some of the matches he's fixed. Yeah. And I didn't know at the time. <clears throat> obviously, and I didn't know until his book and realized later they were fixed. And he was doing what you said. He brought over Zimbabwe teams to Thailand. Yeah. Uh, and he Thailand to South Africa, to plus South Africa. And he was fixing the referees. Not the players on either side, you know, I stand totally honest with the players, they never fixed in national team games. They were too, too proud to fix national team games, ties. But certainly the referees were, were bent, no doubt. I mean, proven, they got arrested. You know, it was all proved. I think so it's a complex issue. It's yeah. A whole I, program. I was going to say, I think that's the problem where uh, third parties are allowed to organise matches. But when the third parties are then allowed to organise the referees, that's when you have a problem. That's where the where the problem starts to arise from. But um, Thailand Thailand played Syria. I sat next to Robbo. I said, Robbo, we've got no hope here, mate. He said, What do you mean? Look at the refs. They weren't Thai refs. They were Bulgarian referees. Thailand v Syria with Bulgarian referees. You're joking. You know, and it turned out <clears throat> the score was one all. Both sides got a penalty. Side of people. So I'd say the Syrian men on the take either, but the refs obviously they planned the game, and it was just embarrassing. But the blokes who run the game, that's why, and as you say, you never know how high up the system goes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so moving on then. So the family issue that you return to England. This, I, this I don't want to say as a as a criticism, but it's going to be difficult to come out without criticising the system in the UK, and I mean the UK as a whole, I mean Scotland and England and Wales, with the lack of respect shown to coaches that have coached in Asia. And of course the reason I bring that up is because you removed, you, you you moved back to England, but you found it diff you applied for jobs, county uh, FA coaching jobs, you never got returned emails, um, and, and you also worked at the AFC in a FIFA a coach advisor, but somehow this wasn't enough to, to match their remit without trying to kind of yeah, I, wounds, yeah. I, I came back, <clears throat> I, I came back basically because my mum was getting old and with the COVID situation, it's yeah. time to do the right thing. Uh, obviously, still love football, still want to work. I've got to be realistic. So went to both county FAs, Cheshire and Liverpool. Lovely people, nice pe people, no, you know, treated well and things like that but whenever I approached in terms of working and in first cases I, I actually approached a volunteer put on sessions as sessions or speak about Asia never reply uh, I did some work for the LMA for a fellow called Robin Russell yeah, who does online coaching courses he was tremendous he really like helped me out in that sense so you know that area was was, was good but um I'm gonna be realist. I'm not famous in England. You have to accept that. You know, you can't, you can't change that. There's better coaches than me 
so you don't, I don't let it worry me. Then it was very quickly, we're just going to do like a, a quick fire comparison round. So you just need to give us one of the answers. If you can think for maybe only one or two seconds before you give us the answer, uh, just, just to see what your responses on this are, okay? So you with me on that, Steve? Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Liverpool yep, or Liverpool. Ever? Liverpool. You can change your wife, you can change your religion, but you can't change your club. Good answer. Don Revy or Brian Clough? Clough. Never met him, but he just seems wonderful. Coaching in the sun or coaching in the cold? Having coached at Sheffield in the winter, <laughs> coaching in the sun. <laughs> Rice or potatoes? Oh, chips. I'm absolutely sick of rice. <laughs> Vietnamese coffee, café denda, or English tea? Malaysian coffee. I got served Malaysian coffee by a girl, Mazita, and it was wonderful. <laughs> Vietnamese coffee is just takes too long to, to drink. <laughs> and, and also gives you too much heart palpitation. Uh, a bowl of Scouse or a packet of Everton mints? I've not had Scouse for years, but especially school Scouse dinners. <laughs> so you would go to you would go for the Scouts over the Everton mints then? Absolutely, yeah. So that's the end of that round, and we're coming to the end of the uh, end of the interview. I heard you say once in an interview. I can't remember if I heard it or if <coughs> I saw it in, in an interview where you said that you need to be like bamboo. Could you elaborate more on your thoughts of? being more like bamboo? When I first came to Asia, I was probably still a bit, I'll say colonial, that my okay. way was right. And I suddenly learned that my way isn't always right. You've got to listen. You've got to listen to people. You've got to listen to local knowledge. You can accept it or you can reject it. Okay, so last question. And again, thank you very much for your time. But la last question here. If you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, way back in the early days of when you were playing at Tranmere Rovers, what is the most important thing that you would pass on to your younger self? Keep the passion. Just keep that, because without that passion, without love of the game, you'll get nowhere. I mean, all the pros I know, and the highest, the highest people I've known have been decent blokes as well, but they've also been passionate. They've loved the game as a kid, and it's carried on through their, through their life. Keep the passion. I do weights, because there wasn't any weight training in my days. Yeah. Because I, I think, and I'd also I'd, I'd take the advice I give now about nutrition yeah. and lifestyle, yeah. because there was no nutrition and no lifestyle advice when I got it when I was a kid. There was beer. I drank beer because that's a had to. It was culturally the right thing, which in hindsight I shouldn't have. You know, I didn't have new proper nutrition. I ate what my mum gave me yeah. because that's what my mum gave me. Yeah. And I learned that in when I was in Singapore, I made the mistake of bringing in a nutritionist. Uh, and it, one of the players said to me, we go to the street for our food. It's our pet mother who cooks the food. So I had to bring in the nutritionist to the mums. And it had to be a female because they didn't want a male trying to teach nutrition to Malaysian or Singaporean mums. Yeah, yeah. So that would be my, and the main thing is enjoy it. In, it's a great job in the world. Enjoy play, play as long as you can, you know, and just, Keep, it, keep the passion going. Yeah. Steve, it's been absolutely amazing. It's been brilliant speaking today. I honestly, I don't even want to edit this video down because I could listen to people like yourself talking about football all day and all night. And I'm absolutely delighted to finally catch up with you and get you on the show. So once again, th thanks very much for coming on. Come on and say good luck, Adil. Great lad. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. So again, a huge thank you to Steve Darby for getting him on the show here at Harkis CGTV. Such a, a fascinating person to talk to. Delighted to have him on the show. Let us know what you thought down in the comments. Let us know anyone else that you think or that you want us to interview. We'd love to reach out to them and try and get them on the show. Remember, listen, the beats that are playing in the background are Bunty Beats. Links are down in the description. Make sure you continue to like, share, follow. Heart of CGTV. Mm.